my goodness, you guys. This week has kicked my little cute black ass. I'll tell you what. That's why I have on my sunglasses at night because my eyes are just not giving what I want them to get for the camera. I'm just, you know, I'm also reading Mariah Carey's autobiography. And even though I haven't gotten anywhere near the part of her life in which she would conduct herself in such a way, um, I am just through getting the roots of her story, really leaning into my need to just be my full self, no matter where I am, I am showing up as me. And so me right now is wearing these sunglasses because I am vain. Don't let the politics fool you, okay? I am a vanity girl. Black does sometimes crack, but that's only if you let it. And I feel like this evening, I just look like somebody who spent a bit of time trying to find my cute angle. It's just not showing up right about now. My hair is also doing a thing because I haven't had a proper haircut in seven months. Thanks, Trump. Um, you know, I, I just, I'm processing all of this stuff, right? I'm grieving, I'm working and, and working under really not ideal conditions from, you know, my home, my comfortable home, but my home nonetheless, um, and not having a separation between work and home, which is devastating for somebody who, even as a freelancer, always separated those spaces. Like, I do not write articles in my house. Like, I have not done great work in, in places that I've lived, and I'm having to uh, adjust to that being my normal, but like, you know, there have been things that have actually brought me to tears um, this past week, and that's different because I thought I had built up such a beautiful emotional barrier between myself um, and you know my traumas and our collective traumas. Like I was doing good. Like I was really like I was a wall. I was stiff as a board. You know, it's very unmoving. Like my way of coping would be to just take breaks, you know, like I would do this and people, you know, I know some of my friends and uh, followers on like Instagram or whatever, probably think I'm like super eccentric or super nutty. And I guess I'm not making the case against that right now, wearing the sunglasses. Also, I'm gonna stop being a complete narcissist and I'm gonna look at the camera instead of looking at myself. I know this is the worst show on the whole internet because I stare at myself the whole time, I'm sorry. Uh, it's just hard not to be insecure about aging in public and like not being able to like do all your glam stuff, right? Like that that's the, the sweetest part of girlhood for me, from of my girlhood. It is how I get to express myself through fashion and 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 how I, you know, show up in the world and wearing fake eyelashes and, and long nails. I broke down and got a manicure, you guys. I went to, see, I wasn't even looking at you. I went to a parking lot. I got my nails done in the parking lot of the Beverly Center. And it was one of the greatest experiences of my life because I couldn't stand looking at my hands. I couldn't stand looking at my own hands, you know, because I wasn't taking care of them. And, and I, I, typically would go get, I wore nails. That was a big part of me. It was part of my identity, right? It was part of, part of my femininity was, was those nails and the lashes and they're gone and it sucks. And we've lost so much more and that is so insignificant in the grand scheme of things. This is the thing that sucks right now. It's uncomfortable, right? And so I'm persistently uncomfortable. I'm, I'm coping with the work stuff. I'm coping with that. I'm coping with the forced celibacy. I'm coping with, you know, being distant from my family. And there's our our collective traumas in this moment, of course. And then when it just seems like it, it's just you're at capacity, a motherfucker who has played the same character in every single movie for nearly the entire duration of my life decided that he had a plan for Black America, that he had the answers, and that he was going to present them to the two people who were running for office and may the best man win. And sorry for us, the best man just happened to be Donald Trump this time. Hour later, Ice Cube, AKA Craig, where he is Craig in all places and all times. He's Craig in the barbershop. He's Craig in the minivan with Neil Long and the kids. He's Craig in the war. Just Craig. Craig in the club. Craig decided that he had an agenda for Black America. Craig did not consult people outside of, excuse me, out of Craig's um, inner circle of, I don't know, sectional. 
And he did this at a time in which we are literally begging people to vote not to continue to allow an incompetent JV dictator to allow us to all die of the coronavirus. That we are begging people to use their vote to prevent that from happening. And he's playing around with the idea of maybe we could get Juneteenth as a holiday or some bullshit. I can't. That wasn't what made me cry. What made me cry was the episode of Shit's Creek where the vet, Ted, tells the girl that he loves her. And that is how I experience my favorite shows. And that is how I experience people in the world. Her name is The Girl. I watch Shit's Creek every day. I can't think of her name. I probably won't think of it until tomorrow. But I am so invested in their relationship now that I cried actual blubbery tears watching them get together. So between Shit's Creek and Shit's All Bad and Gen X Black Man Land, I'm wearing my sunnies. I don't have my signature cocktail glass like I usually do. I usually have a wine glass, a little cocktail glass, or a cocktail in a wine glass, because that's why I'm still getting unpacked. And I think that's what I did in the old apartment anyway, but whatever, and I was looking at myself again, my bad. But this time you see, because you know I'm an incense and crystals type of bitch, I got my crystal water bottle. But this is a vodka tonic. And it was in this moment that I became such a tragic parody of the mommy bloggers that I spent the good duration of my 20s and 30s to date laughing at, that I laughed at until this very moment, until I realized I was one of them. All I need is a sweatshirt that says, it's wine o'clock. Anyway, um, Considering all of the bullshit that's going on in this moment and how that bullshit is particularly targeted in the direction of black women, because of course you don't have Ice Cube showing up with a plan for black America. You don't have Kanye West diverting votes away from Biden for seemingly no reason at all. You don't have 50 Cent endorsing Trump. You don't have black men saying, why would we give our votes to Joe Biden so easily? Why do we trust him? if you don't have the DNC making a concerted effort to talk to black women. Black women were affirmed in public and now we're being punished for it. We were acknowledged for carrying the party over the finish line many times without seeing some of the affirmations, some of the legislation that other critical voting blocks that may include some of us, but not all of us have enjoyed. We are not treated like wealthy donors. We are not treated like special interest groups and lobbyists. We're not treated like we have any skin in the game. We're expected to show up and do the work. And we've done that. But also that's how we show, look at how much we show up considering the lack of engagement, the lack of love and support, right? What if we were actually engaged? What if we were affirmed? Well, we're seeing that. And what are we experiencing now that we're being affirmed in public? Now that the faces of the modern day social justice movement are largely female, despite their efforts to say this is decentralized leadership, when you think of the people who have led in this moment, you're thinking of black women too. Notice I didn't say exclusively, I said two. You're also thinking of us. We are taking our place aside our brothers, where we always should have been, where you've always been, but we haven't been treated with the rights and dignity that come with that positioning. More of us are speaking up about that now, and there's backlash. And talk about being willing to cut your nose off to spite your face. And that's because I suppose being just one adjective away from white supremacist patriarchy's ideal figure, black cis had men, some, not all, not even most, some believe that them ascending to that level 
is enough. I don't want, this is, of course, this is the pedagogy of the oppressed, right? Like I'm not uh, breaking down a new theory here, but I'm acknowledging that we're watching this happen in this very public way, in a very painful way, at a very painful time. We're watching, I will sell my people out. I will sell my women out. I don't care. My success is enough. We're watching that in real time. Because the success of black men is considered to be black success and it's sufficient. It's enough. Because efforts to fight for freedom on behalf of black men are considered efforts to fight for justice and freedom on behalf of black people. They have been made to represent the whole. We have centered them. All of us, we have done this. We have been trained to do this our whole lives. If there's anything the community agrees upon, it's that black men and boys are disenfranchised. We have not come to that agreement about black women and girls in any meaningful way. We have not come to that agreement as it relates to the gender-based violence that black women and girls face in the community, the sexual violence that black women and girls face in the community. We haven't reckoned with the sexual violence that the black men and boys have faced in our community because we are, we won't reckon with that because it deviates from the idea of manhood that we've put at the center and the heart of our dreams of black liberation for far too long. And when I say we, I mean, when we all come together, this is what we get. It's not where we've all been politically, but collectively, this is the voice that we're able to, to, to raise up. Anyway, I'm rambling a bit, but what I wanna say is on the other side, you have black women and girls who recognize that if black women and girls have the things that they need in this nation, everyone will have their needs met. Everyone will do better if black women and girls are doing better. And so I have two phenomenal people here that I'm so excited to talk about and they have fancy new titles since I uh, worked with them. So I wanna make sure that I get them correct and give them all their proppers. Please welcome to the Zoom stage, Morgan Fletcher, the Director of Marketing and Storytelling for Girls for Gender Equity, and Tony Wilson, the Director of Organizing for Girls for Gender Equity. Ugh, gen girls for Gender Equity. I've said that 500,000 times in my life. Um, I don't know why I'm tripping over it now. Hello and welcome, welcome, welcome. Hi, Hi. thank you. Thank you for having us. Thank you for being here. It is wonderful to see your beautiful faces. Um, Tony and Morgan represent an organization that I had the privilege of um, working with uh, as a consultant a couple summers ago, uh, based in Brooklyn, New York, founded by Joanne Smith. Girls for Gender Equity has worked to center Black women and girls, to center Black girls, I should say, in the modern day fight for racial and gender justice. Um, and their work centers black girls, uh, queer and gender non-conforming teens. Um, and they have done incredibly radical and transformative work on the policy side. Um, they are directly responsible, I'd say, for a change in the funding for title funding and staffing for Title IX officers in New York City. There was one Title IX officer in New York City for 1.1 million students and their families. One Title IX officer to handle every allegation of sexual violence, to deal with any issue of gender-based discrimination, to step in when a school has a boy soccer team but doesn't offer a girl soccer team, and now there are girls that are interested in having a soccer team, and they have to go through the process of getting a new team established. All of these things falling under the umbrella of one person, and uh, GGE fought that and won. Um, they work, uh, they also are a direct service provider working with youth between the ages of 14 and 25 or 21? 24. 24. Okay, I couldn't remember. I was like, oh, it was when I worked with you all, it was when I really realized how far outside of like youth I was in that regard because it used to be like just right there. I was like, wow, I'm like an adult, adult. But anyway, um, any, I, I love you all. I love the work that you all do. I was so proud to, you know, get to sit in the office with you all a couple days a week. 
um, for summer. And I'm so proud and excited to talk to you all today. Um, Morgan, can you talk uh, briefly about the work of GGE? And then Tony, I want you to tell us about your baby, the agenda for Black girls. I'm sorry, excuse me, a national agenda for Black girls. You know how we, we do that, right? You know, the Black girl agenda, it's gonna end up being the Black girl agenda. I'm just warning you. Mm -hmm. Like by the time all is said and done and it's in everybody's mouth like it needs to be, we're just like, oh, you know, well, the Black girl agenda is having a program. Mm -hmm. So but for now, we're gonna call it by its proper name, a national agenda for Black girls. Yeah, I'm definitely happy to kick us off. And Jamila, thank you for having us. And we miss you a lot, um, but it's yeah, awesome to be able to all. share this space with you. Um, and yes, actually, just as a sidebar, we do basically internally still call it the Black Girl Agenda, even though we all know it has a real name. <laughs> <laughs> and I know it. it. I know it. <laughs> we can't help it. You know, you said perfect. this quickly. Yeah, it's <laughs> perfect. It fits. Um, but yeah, so Girls for Gender Equity, um, is an organization based in Brooklyn. You gave a great introduction, but I'll just fill in um, some of the other areas. Um, we're nearly 20 years old um, and are going through a very exciting moment right now where we are um, growing and strategizing and expanding. I started the organization in 2018. Obviously now we are in the longest year of the world, um, 2020. And the in world. just those two years <laughs> the all, of all time, honestly. And just in those two years, when I first started, we were doing the, we were launching the School Girls Deserve campaign, which is the one that you were just speaking about um, with the Title IX officer focus. And that was our, one of our first, that was our first campaign. And we were like, okay, we're gonna do this based on all this research that we've been doing for years, or the team had been doing for years, I wasn't there yet. And then um, here we are with Tony's baby, this national campaign. So we have made huge strides in our work, found amazing coalition partners, and um, are just really pushing forward, particularly in this moment um, in the US where there seems to be a lot of responsiveness to the kind of work that we've been doing. And frankly, black women have been doing for a long time, um, cis and transgender black folks um, who are out here just on the streets every day. So we're just part of that movement. Um, so like you said, Girls for Gender Equity, centering cisgender and transgender girls and gender expansive youth of color in the fight for racial and gender justice. And if you wanna learn more, you can follow us on social, uh, GGENYC on Instagram and Twitter. And we do uh, direct service work, like you said, we run two different programs, uh, three different, we just launched another one, um, programs for direct service. We do policy work, we do organizing work, and we also do culture shift work, which is a very broad category that just means being part of the conversations that are happening on the ground from the perspective of how young people are experiencing them. So for example, we'll get into more of this in the conversation, I'm sure, but um, you know, what does it mean for Megan the Stallion to be in the spotlight in the way that she has been in the last several weeks? How does that impact our black girls? And we use girls as a um, catch-all term, an umbrella term. So uh, please excuse the jargon. It is inclusive for us. Um, but yeah, so how does it, how do these moments affect our girls and what do they need in this moment to feel seen, to feel supported and also feel like they're activated, so how can they use that energy to create change? Um, so we do a lot of civic engagement work. National campaign, as Tony will talk about, is focusing a lot on voting and getting folks registered and um, understanding the power of their vote. Uh, so yeah, so that's what GGE does. And we are, consider ourselves an intergenerational organization as well. So young people are uh, involved in every aspect of our work and the programmatic work informs the policy work and we're centering their voices in our culture work as well. So it's just a really awesome space. Prior to this, I was not working with young people and they will keep you sharp and they will remind you how old you're getting. <laughs> Absolutely. So okay. yeah, so that's what we're doing. And I'm our um, director of marketing and storytelling, like you said. So doing, um, holding a lot of the communication pieces, external and internal, and making sure that our stories are told in a way that people can receive, digest, want to talk about, um, and that moves our work forward. You know, one uh, note I can attest to GGE being an intergenerational space because the summer that I worked with you all, um, the summer that I worked with these lovely ladies, 
was the last summer that we lived in New York City and Naima came to the office with me quite often. And, you know, I, yes. I mentioned this on the show before, but every office that I've worked in has been a Na Naima friendly space. Like she comes with the package. So I'm, so I'm like, she pops on, on here. I'm like, you know, she comes with me, you know? And like, she was very welcome in GGE, but she was more than welcome because one day she declared, and this was, she must have been, she's seven now, so she had to have been five. She declared that she was the boss. Like she made everybody <laughs> yep. money. She like paid them. She complained when they weren't doing their work. And like, she literally like lorded around like she was the boss. She really did. <laughs> it was amazing. Like, I she actually, actually um, did. I found mm -hmm. the money that she drew for me. Like I found my Naima bills the other day and I was like, oh, I'm keeping these. Oh. These need to be laminated. <laughs> You have, to, you have to laminate those. Please keep those forever. Mm -hmm. so, so, Tony, the national, a national agenda for Black girls. Tell us everything. Yes. Um, first, I feel like you laid such an amazing groundwork and framing at the beginning. So thank you for that. And also thank you, Morgan, for highlighting that. When we say Black girls, we do use it as an, an all-inclusive term. Um, where do we start? So we know as Black women who have been Black girls that every year for Black girls is crucial. Every year is important. Every year is critical, right? Um, and at GGE, moving into the 2020 election year, we knew that this was going to be a year where Black girls' voices and needs needed to be front and center. Um, something that you um, pointed out earlier, Janelle, is that we know like through racial and gender work, um, where the most marginalized folks sit, right? You know that Black girls are at the margin, meaning that they are, you know, closer to, like, further from the center, and our work and our mission and purpose is to bring them from the margin to the center where their needs are being met on a political, um, on a policy lens, right? So when we launched, we, I guess I'll backtrack a little bit, we launched a national agenda for Black girls almost a year out now, so November of 2019, can't believe time flew so quickly. Um, and we launched it, right? Wow. We launched it as an organization that recognized that one, we're built on um, Black feminist theory and thought, and also recognizing that if a, an elected, if a presidential candidate wants to uphold and wants to hold the highest seat in this country, the highest um, position, that they have to be centering the needs and priorities of Black girls. Full stop. Um, and that's what this agenda is really working to do. And you also pointed out earlier that Black women are the backbone of the Democratic Party, right? Like we pull up and we vote in astonishing numbers. And our goal with this and our framing is that Black girls most times become Black women and Black women vote. Like no one shows up to the polls more than we do. So it's mind boggling that we show up to the polls, but yet our priorities, our needs are last brought to the table. So with this part, with this agenda, we're saying that these six policy priorities that Black girls have laid out that are pivotal and crucial to their needs, their communities, their schools, their homes, their churches, they need to be put on the agenda, full stop, right? Um, we can talk about, if we're thinking about Black girls who are in school, we know right now, if we, if we frame this in the lens of school push out, 60% um, of all female and Black identified young people in schools are arrested, right? We know that they are two times, two up, two thirds times more likely than their white counterparts to experience school push out. And that can look like detention, expulsion, all the things, right? We also understand that black women and girls are four times more likely to die during childbirth, right? And we also know that there's so many ways in which black girls are being impacted by systems. And there has to be some foundational policies in this country that say Black girls are valued, that they matter, that they deserve to be here, that they are prioritized. And that's really what a National Agenda for Black Girls mission is to do. Um, so a little bit more about the agenda itself, it is comprised and led by, like Morgan said, we do all our work intergenerationally. It's led by a steering committee of 15 young people recruited from and nominated from our partner orgs across the country. So this is a collaborative initiative as Morgan said, it is GD's first national initiative. Um, and we're partnering with our 
friends and um, folks at, let me see, let's see, all of our places. So we have every Black girl in South Carolina. We have our folks, Young Women's Freedom Center in the Bay Area. We have Gwen's Girls and Girls Justice League in Pittsburgh and Philadelphia. We have our Young Women's Initiative collaborators in D.C. And we also have our folks and partners in your hometown, Jamila, a long walk home in Chicago. Yeah. Um, jump in, Morgan, if I forgot any. It was, it's like there's so many of them. I feel like I sometimes forget them, but I feel like I... And Soul Sisters in Miami. I knew I forgot one. One always mm-hmm. just went through in my mind. Um, yeah, so we're partnering with those folks who have nominated brilliant young people who are organizers, who are um, activists in their communities, who are doing, committed to doing national policy work. And they're leading this work. They have been holding town halls. Tomorrow, they're going to lead us in a roundtable discussion on what leadership looks like in this country. So please tune in for that. Um, yeah, they're, gonna, they're doing amazing things. At the top of this year in February, they created a presidential questionnaire, which we were able to put out into the world to um, all the presidential candidates who were running at the time. At the time, there was about 50, 11 of them. Um, so we were able to share that with the Biden team, numerous amounts of teams um, across that were running. And really, they were able to ask the presidential elect, what are your plans for me? How do you plan to censor yeah. myself, my family, my peers? Um, and all in all, I will sum it up and say national agenda is a, for me, when I think about it, and I think as GGE thinks about it, it's a, a rallying cry for like both public and private sector policy elected policymakers to really center the needs of of black girls and to support them um and for us to remember that black girls needs cannot wait so we can't censor black boys and then say okay we'll get to black girls later we need to get to black girls now um now is the moment and now is the time i think it's it's such an amazing agenda and the framing is just so desperately needed you know and Earlier, Tanya, you're saying, you know, we know the black girls are experiencing school push out at, at you know, um, a rate besting all of their peers uh, in, in terms of gender. And we know that black women are more likely to experience intimate partner violence. You know, it's like we know, but the collective we, I don't think knows that, you know, and I, it, it's, it's a willful, I love because unfortunately there's not nearly enough polling and research that goes into the lives of black people. And there's less that goes into the lives and, and, and illnesses, right? And conditions facing black women and girls. Um, there's less study into our lives and there is uh, study into the lives of black men and boys, unfortunately. But I, I wish that there was polling, you know, like I, I wish that we knew how many people knew that, right? Like how many black people know that there's a maternal mortality crisis, right? Cause it didn't show up in everybody's agenda for black America. You know, not everyone knew that that was a thing that's happening. And it's just, it, it's, I go through wondering if it's just willful denial, you know, like of, of just repressing this, you know, particularly for us. Like I, I, if I process this, if I really deal with this, I have to face it, right? Like I, I, mm-hmm. I know that I'm disenfranchised on the basis of being black. I know about racism, I get that, right? But if I have to really reckon with, you know, misogyny, if I have to re- reckon with misogynoir, if I have to reckon with the call is coming from inside the house, it's coming from inside the room, you know, if I have to really mm-hmm. face that, you know, for so many of us, it's the loss of the partner. It's the loss of the father, you know, mm-hmm. it, it, it's a disruption of so many things. And it, it's coming to grips with the fact that you've been violated. You know, there are just so many things that are brought up for us when we dare to look our own trauma in the eye and acknowledge it, name it and say, we want to be centered too. And then on the other side, there's, you know, just the loathing, you know, and, and, and misogyny and, and, disconnect and and the belief that black men are an endangered species and we have to protect them and that's it right like those are factors but for you all I, i'd be curious to hear you answer what um what do you think the greatest barriers are at this moment in history to getting those black folks of all gender expressions who do not recognize the need for an agenda for black girls like like what's the disconnect right now when it feels so obvious Mm. Mm. I something right. that's really coming up for me is can folks still hear me? I feel like I'm lagging. Maybe I, I can hear you. I can hear you. Okay, cool. Um, for something that's immediately coming up for me is the fact that even within our community, 
and then also in the outside communities, and that's all the folks who don't identify as Black who aren't Black. Um, they don't see Black girls as girls, right? Um, so Black girls are seen as women. You can be 11 years old, um, but the world will try to portray you as a 20-year-old grown woman, and you would, you yeah. are the reason why things are happening to you. You are the instigator of your abuse, um, and that things that happen to you in the world are because you brought it onto yourself. Um, so that for me really stands out as to the disconnect between why folks do not see black girls and their essentially their cry for help in these specific moments. I was talking with my friend a, a week ago and we were discussing and we both were saying, I said to her, I was like, yo, black girls are in a state of emergency. Like, I don't know if you feel it, but like, I feel it like direly in my mm -hmm. body. Um, and I think that has, that's a major disconnect of it. Um, people don't acknowledge that we live in this double oppressed, like we, we live in this racism and sexism lane, like the intersection, no one talks about that enough. And I think that's what allows our community as well as, as, well as outside communities to not recognize um, when we're being harmed, um, when the world is not showing up for us, when our communities are not showing up for us. Um, and it also brings me back to one of our fav one of my favorite priorities on the agenda is the Black Girl Bill of Rights. And yeah, for me, it kind of sums up it like sums up all of our policy priorities kind of in one, honestly. Um, and that came out of a conference we had in 2016, where a group of Black women um, and Black girls were able to come together and really just state like what they needed um, from. Like what were the what what were their inalienable rights, right? And one of my favorite ones on there is the right to experience joy, the right to play, um, and the access to sex educate comprehensive sex education. So those all continue to play in my mind of um, the ways that society sees us and the way we continue to see ourselves. Mm -hmm. and that makes me think of too. Um, I'm going to share a story, a short story. Um, that a young person shared with me who's on the steering committee for National Agenda. I won't name them because I did not get consent in advance to share their story with such detail, but um, they reached out to me and, um, you know, they said, I'm having a hard time because I'm trying to tell my friend that they need to protect black women. And my friend is a cisgender guy and he doesn't get it. Like he seems he, like his response was, well, black women are the strongest people on the planet. So like, why do we need to protect y'all? Like you already got it, you're good. And she was so frustrated because this was like, this was her friend. Like this was like, we've been friends for a minute. I trust you, we have an understanding. And here you are talking some bullshit to me, to my face. Um, and she was really struggling because she didn't know how to come, come back at him with anything. You know, she was like, I mean, I'm not trying to tell him that I'm not strong you know, that's not the answer, because I am. Yeah. But I don't understand how to how to break that down for him. And so we had a really good conversation about like, how do you live in the and, right? Not I'm strong, and, mm -hmm. but, you know, or so, therefore I don't need. It's like, I am strong. And still, there are so many sources of oppression in my life that I need you to also back me up. And this is something that our, um, the founder of GGE says, Joanne Smith, we got us. Like we're not out here looking for like a handout or for someone to like come along and save us. This is not some like, you know, white supremacy based nonprofit bullshit. Like we're, yeah. we're good. We actually need people to understand that we know what's best for us. Like mm -hmm. we yeah. have, we have lived experience. It is informed. It is informative and therefore policies and change need to be based on the things that we're actually living. And who's going to tell you what that is besides us? So what are you talking about? <laughs> um, and I think that it's really important to, for folks to realize that we're not going to grow out of misogynoir. We're not gonna be like, mm -hmm. oh, the next generation, they got it. Cause this person's right. a teenager. Yeah. You know, it's her peer mm -hmm. who's out here talking like this. And obviously probably when the opportunity arises, saying it to other people and perpetuating that mindset and they're young and we need to catch it early. Um, and yeah. I think that Gigi, Gigi's programming is very extremely proactive in the sense that we bring young people in to talk about their experiences, but also to talk about the things that could happen and how we can, mm -hmm. you know, cut those off at the pass and proactively approach policymakers and decision makers and stakeholders and, you know, have them step in alongside us to do this work. 
Um, and yeah, I just, I think about her story a lot because I'm like, I need to talk to that little boy. <laughs> you know, but we all do. We need yes. to, we need to start, yeah. start having those conversations really early. And the gag is it doesn't stop. Cause mm -hmm. I say, <laughs> it ain't the look, yep. just look, teens, 20s, 30s. I can tell we all talking to the little boy. If you talk to men, you're going to be talking <laughs> to a little boy for the rest of your life. Um, but yeah, no, just, I'm sorry to tell you, you know, but the trauma is so real. And I'm just I'm, part of the reason that I'm so grateful for GGE is that you are, um, like Morgan said, you're addressing what could happen, right? What may even be likely to happen. But your first introduction to street harassment, and of course, you know, most people have before 12 years old, at, at the very least, experienced it secondhand via their mother, you know, or another uh, mm -hmm. loved one. But, you know, when your introduction to sexual violence, is it happening to you, right? As opposed to having a conversation in which, you know, you, you know to recognize, um, Mm -hmm. how somebody's treating you right when, when this is an abusive situation or this is a predatory situation you know and that doesn't necessarily mean that the trauma is not going to occur but it, it's different than you know the most organizations are doing response work right after the fact you know and and, and so much of it still uh, centers around you know punitive measures right or correcting you know our men and boys not correcting their approach to women and girls in any meaningful way but just correcting them right let's give them some mentors and they'll be fine right those mentors are telling them to you know treat women in the same way that some of the rap songs and locker room conversations are telling them to treat women you know mm -hmm. they're not centering their needs and their need for mentorship and support um but i want to uh I want you all to let folks know how they can get involved to support the national agenda for black girls. I feel like it's so grand and it's so concise and language is so accessible and that it's not, you know, like Joanne says, and, and you quoted Morgan, we got us, you know, so it's not about begging the world outside mm -hmm. to, you know, hear us, seen, and we just want to be seen. We just want to be seen. Like visibility is not the goal. Bitch, you see us. How can you not see us? Look mm -hmm. at how look at how beautiful we are. Look at how bright we are. You know, like how can you miss us? You know, you choose to not see me. You choose to not see my five nine ass ambling down the street. You choose not <laughs> to see, you know, the pain that black women and girls are going through. You choose not to see it. But there it's it's still a call in to those people that have the capacity, right? Who are willing to do the work of saying, I have not done right by black women and girls. And there are people who have done long time racial justice work, who've done long time gender work, who in this moment are reckoning with that, you know, how they fail to show up for us because most people, most persons, places and, and institutions have failed to show up for black women. Throughout history, the majority of everybody has mm -hmm. failed to show up for us. Mm -hmm. for us. So, um, but I think that this, uh, the black the the national agenda for black girls is such a beautiful invitation to join the part you know you you should be here everyone should be here because it's in our collective best interest to support black women and girls so how mm -hmm. can folks um out there get involved with this work and support it yeah so you know what um you might have heard it before but please freaking vote uh so there's um you know, everyone has to, it, it's tough because everyone's ballots are something a little different depending on where you are, depending on when you're voting, but consistently making the effort to vote in the best interest of black women. How do you figure out what the interests of black women are? You have to be listening, you have to be looking. So what I will say is that um, if you were to visit blackgirls2020.com, you would find our National Agenda for Black Girls website, sign up for our newsletter. We are doing weekly newsletters. We are sharing information, resources, next actions, and also moments you can get involved with the campaign, like Tony mentioned, um, we will be doing an event tomorrow, which we're very excited about. Um, it's called Black Girls Be Voting, a conversation on mm -hmm. the future of black girls. And it will be starring the young people from the steering committee. They will be holding conversation with each other. Tony and myself and our colleague Damala will be there to you know, set parameters and support them. But this is a conversation moderated by and held by young people who are talking about mm -hmm. this campaign. They're talking about the issues that affect them. They're talking about their real life experiences and also what they're looking for from a president who truly represents them, not only in terms of the issues that they're addressing, but also like, who is that ideal president, right? Like let's, we're visioning beyond the two options we have at this perilous mm -hmm. moment in time. 
who could we, who would really show up for us? Um, so there's, that's a great opportunity tomorrow for 30 PM Eastern. And, um, you know, you can register, follow us on Instagram, GGENYC. We'll set y'all up. But yeah, so there's definitely that option. Um, of course, we are a nonprofit, so I'm not going to be cute about it. You should give us money yes, yes. <laughs> because we actually pay young people for their time, for their energy. The conversation that we're having right now, like, you know, we're here with our drinks and we love each other and we're holding space. Yeah. But young people are doing all of that on top of school, on top of navigating COVID, mm-hmm. on top of taking care of their families, because we know black girls uh, are are disproportionately tasked with doing household tasks, taking care of family and supporting them um, compared to their, you know, compared to their peers. So it's really like, how can we make this space not only beneficial to them in terms of education and advocacy work, Mm -hmm. but also you deserve to be compensated for the emotional labor that you are doing to show up in this space. And we love you enough to pay you for that. So speaking of people, we love it enough. So there's always the opportunity to support financially is how that goes. Yes. Um, Anything else, Tony? Yeah. Yeah, I would also add one or two things in there. If you aren't registered to vote and you are still able to register in your local city, please use our voter poll. We partner with When We All Vote to drive a lot of Black girls and their communities to mobilize them to the polls. So please check out our voter poll. Um, when we all vote.org backslash GGE. And also, if you are a young person who are who is interested in joining the city community, you're interested in this work, you're an organizer, an activist, or you're not an organizer and you're just like, I'm a black girl and this all makes sense to me, please feel free to reach out to us, whether it's on Instagram. Um, you can email me at twilson at ggenyc.org and I am happy to um, meet with you and add you to our fan community and get to know you. Yeah. And even if you're just a person out there who says this speaks to me, it resonates, it lands, I want to amplify this work, come to us. Um, We also have um, blackgirls2020 at ggenyc.org as the primary contact email for the project. So if you're like, hey, I also have a podcast and I also have an audience, I wanted to have some young people on there. We're happy to work with you because what this really requires, like Jamila, you were saying, like people are choosing not to look and that has been normalized to an extent that people don't even realize that they're doing it that's the way white supremacy works so we need all the support we can get to get to the microphone all hands on deck thank you so all much. hands yes mm-hmm. thank you for calling us in everyone you've heard your task uh please follow support amplify the work of gge um and i allowed uh your former boss wanted to come say hi she was very excited to know that two of her favorite aunties as she called you uh, tonight would be on the show oh. <laughs> it good to see the ladies i'm on it so before we get out of here we're gonna play the game that we always play that this week we're gonna call it's it a game where no baby voice it's a game where um like you ask questions, like a, you ask quick kid questions, and um, you have to answer them. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to ask you some questions. What are we calling the game this week? You want to name it? Um, I don't know. Okay, so we'll call it quick question. <laughs> um, I want to ask the questions. Okay, uh, I'll put. Right. Let's see. I, well, why don't we make this a competition? Tony versus Morgan. So you have to give them both. <laughs> it can't be like one can't be really hard, one can't be really easy, okay? That's so okay. we'll start with Morgan and we'll go left to right on the camera, okay? So I'm going to put 60 seconds on the clock. You're going to ask Morgan as many questions as you That's can. One minute. one minute is 60 seconds. We will discuss that so later. One minute and 60. So one minute <laughs> is 60. All right. We're going to do Morgan first, okay? Ready? And go. Uh, how do you make the trees? <laughs> um, I don't have uh, much hand in that, but I think there is some um, seed planting going on um, and some watering going on and some sun access. How Next question. Make, how do you make seeds? Oh, we're really breaking it down. Um, okay, so 
um, seeds are an organic material that I, I could not make. Well, I guess there's a scientist somewhere who's making meat out of plants. So maybe that's not even true anymore. Like I don't actually now I don't know. Um, I would need to be in the laboratory. How's that for an evasive answer? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now you like, I guess. <laughs> you got what's organic? Organic is all natural, untainted by any human made chemicals or preservatives. You over. No, <laughs> not you over. I'm over time. <laughs> you made it. You made it. That was pretty impressive. Okay. Okay. Fire. What happened at the end? She just kind of was like, uh, well, I think I know all the things now. Are you ready, Tony? 60 seconds on the clock. Many questions as you can handle. You ready? You ready? You ready? You ready? Okay. All right. And start. Uh, uh, how do you make lipstick? Oh, you melt crayon, your favorite color of crayon, and you add some oil, and you let it sit and set, and then you put it on. So is that how you make your purple lipstick? Um, is that how I made mine? No, I purchased mine from NYX. It's called Miami by NYX. <laughs> I, did not per I did not make mine. Well, how do you make a state? <laughs> a state? How I make it? Um, okay, well, first they they get it from the cow, so it's a beef, so it comes from the cow, and then when you buy it at the store and you like take it home, you clean it, wash it, a season state. it. A state. How do I what? State like California, New York, a state. Oh my gosh, a state! I thought you said steak, girl. I was like, we got fancy jewelry. <laughs> How do you make a steak? Off the clock, you, you, you steal land from the indigenous folks. I tell, I, I, <laughs> that is the way they made states. <laughs> That's how they made the state. <laughs> Great, ladies. You all are ready for, and I told Joanne this before, for GGE to expand into programming for children under the age of 12. You know, it's time to <laughs> bring the little, little ones in. Um, this has been such a great conversation. Thank you all so much. Uh, a National Agenda for Black Girls. It is such a powerful document. It is such a powerful call to action. And, and it provides... I think for those who may still be lacking it, a really precise clarity on uh, some of the unique conditions that black women and girls are facing and some of the conditions that we face, excuse me, that overlap with our men, um, but that have been publicly, you know, or most publicly identified as black men's issues, as black boys issues, for you to mm -hmm. see that we are suffering in many ways from the same disease and have issues of our own. So thank you all. Uh, thank you, Morgan. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Girls for Gender Equity, for your work. Uh, thank you, former Girls for Gender Equity uh, boss in charge, Naima Freedom. <laughs> and that is the special Wednesday edition of The Kids Are Sleep. You are encouraged to- It's um, Tuesday. Today is Wednesday. Why did you do it on Wednesday? Because tomorrow is the presidential debate and there are but people that are still- supposed to do it on Thursday. Yes, but tomorrow's the presidential debate and there are people who are gonna subject themselves to that. I don't know if I'm gonna be one of them. <laughs> um, where the folks on stage cannot compare, we are here uh, celebrating and calling for the things that black girls need because when we have what we need, everybody has what they need. So. Thank mm -hmm. you, audience. Thank you, guests. Thank you, Progeny. I will see you guys next week. Be safe. Thank you. Thank you all. Bye.